thanks everybody for coming to this uh, breakout session. My name is Jim Stephenson. I'm the Director of Business Development for Economic Alliance in Homish County. And uh, I'll kind of run through how our uh, program is going to work today. So the panel, this is called uh, Putting a Price on the Health of Business. So we're going to look at health care through the eyes of business, business leaders, employers and employees. So we'll start with a presentation uh, from Tom Perry here in a minute, and then I'll invite some panelists up who will, uh, we have some questions for them. We'll run through those questions, try to capture their answers. Uh, if we have time, we'll get a few questions from the audience. Then we'll pare it down to four or five key takeaways, which we'll report back to the big group. We're gonna do all this by 2.15, so I think we'll, uh, it's an aggressive schedule, but we can make it work, so. First, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Tom Perry, who's going to talk to us about from health as a cost to health as a business value. Please come on up, Tom. Thank you. Well, I was told I have seven minutes to lay this whole thing out, so I will be efficient and uh, brief. Uh, just a, a quick word about my organization, Integrated Benefits Institute. We're a, a private, not-for-profit research group focused on the business value of workforce health. We're taking health out of the benefits discussion only and bringing it to the senior leaders in business about the importance of workforce health as part of business strategy. So my organization is supported by over 1,100 companies across the U.S. A thousand of those companies are employers from the Fortune One, Walmart, all the way down to employers with 200 buys in every industry in every part of the country. And they're all asking the same questions. Why should we invest in health? What does it mean to our business? So I want to <clears throat> lay that out today, <clears throat> really go through the transition of where employers are going in this journey of health as cost to health as business value. And we all know that it certainly wasn't very long ago that health care was just a cost of doing business. Employers bore that cost. It was just one of the costs that, that uh, they had to deal with, and they went on. But as costs started to increase, then what did employers do in response? They changed their plan designs. From indemnity plans, to PPOs, to HMOs, narrow networks, whatever you want to call this, as a way to try to, to dampen the cost growth effect on their companies. A lot of that involved shifting cost and risk to employees. But the idea was for the employer, as long as we can affect our trend, then that's what matters. But the next step in that conversation, as employers realize that if we want to keep our best employees, our most productive employees, our leading edge employees, there's a limit how much cost and risk we can put on their shoulders. And so the discussion went like this. It was, well, you know, if we start to move upstream <clears throat> in this healthcare discussion, if we start to fo focus on health risk and how to improve health of employees, we can achieve that goal of affecting our healthcare costs. So there's a tremendous body of work, both in the research literature as well as in the employer community, about improving health, improving, improving health risks as a way to control health care costs. But then a funny thing happened. <clears throat> Employers recognized that it's very hard to spend medical dollars to save medical dollars. And so employers stepped back and said, what are other outcomes of health, of health that actually matter to our business? And they realized those outcomes include absence from work, disability, performance at work, and the productivity consequences of those factors. And that's really good news for those of us that on the one hand are working in wellness to improve health and health care, and those of us who are trying to communicate to senior leaders of why we should do this. And as we all know, with the Affordable Care Act, employers have all kinds of new options, including walking away and saying, I'm done with it, I'm gonna pay the fines, employees, you're on your own. Or going to full replacement consumer driven health plans, hoping that the employee will become magically a good consumer of health care and make the right decisions. 
So this conversation has broadened dramatically. The outcomes of health have broadened. But there's the next step in this transformation, and that is looking at what we might even call the social determinants of health from the employer's perspective. The recognition that employee health behaviors and engagement are influencing this conversation. Corporate culture and climate. We're just about to publish research actually this week on the impact of work climate on absence and performance and productivity and this growing conversation of well-being. So here's what's happening as we see it. As CFOs, we've done a lot of work with CFOs. We're about to publish our fourth study of CFOs this fall. As CFOs get more involved in this conversation, they're looking at it from a business performance standpoint. And they're asking the question, what can we do in our organization to improve business performance? Health is part of that. Investments in health is part of that. But these other dimensions, engagement, well-being, corporate culture, are also a part of it. If we're going to be successful in this conversation, we have to convince senior leaders that health matters to the business. It's more than just a cost center to be minimized. Now, a lot of our work at IBI in research and, and quantitative work, you know, we've learned that when you work with employers, uh, employers, on the one hand, really want to do the right things for their employees. Employers, on the other hand, understand that they can't do the right things often without the right data. But then the employers will say, we don't have the right data. We don't even know what data are the right data. I manage the health program. I don't even know what data exists around health in other parts of my organization. So one of the things we do at IBI as part of our work with employers is we build models to help an employer better understand what the economic impacts of health are to their business. I have never seen in my 20 years of starting and running IBI a VP of benefits will go to the CFO and say, I've got no information, but I know we need to change everything here with regard to our healthcare uh, approach. So what we've done is we've built models to help an employer get their arms around this issue given the characteristics of their company, so they can sit down and have a new conversation, not only internally with senior leaders, but their counterparts across their silo programs and with their vendor partners. So here's an example of, of uh, one of the models we uh, ran with one of our employer members. And as you can see here, if we look at that red slice, healthcare, that is delivery of medical care and pharmacy benefits is a little more than a third of the total economic impact of health for this company, a third. Now, as we all know, most employers have thought about health as being equal to healthcare costs. And this demonstrates that the healthcare cost piece is less than half of what health really means economically to our business. That's why CFOs will pay attention. Because as we improve health, we can drive cost reductions in things like absence in wage replacements and low performance from work. These are the things that CFOs really care about as they run their business, as they're responsible for the, their own key metrics to their boards of directors. The other part of this conversation is where it's going next, and I call this health, bringing health to the top line. This is work by American Express. <clears throat> this is one of our member companies. We're doing some, some work with them right now. What American Express recognized, Dr. Wayne Burton, who's the medical director of the AMX, has been in this field for a long time, done some of the leading research. <coughs> what Wayne understood, that American Express, credit card is king. That is, the credit card business is critical to the business success of American Express. He also recognized, and actually in a conversation with one of his managers in India, who said, you know, people who are healthier have better customer service scores. And customer service scores really matter to the company with regard to keeping customers. And so what Wayne did is he said, I want to look to see if the health of our populations influences their customer service scores. Because if it does, then I can have a new and much broader conversation with our senior leaders about why the investments in health matter to our business. 
It's a top line revenue generating issue, not just a broad bottom line cost. And what we show here is a comparison of groups and health risks. And Wayne found that people in better health have better customer service scores. And that is a different conversation about health and work that we're doing a lot more in in research at IBI, working with employers to bring health to the top line, help them have that conversation with their senior leaders. And then finally, I just want to say we'll be working with the Institute in this initiative, uh, working with a group of employers in Snohomish County in bringing some of our research and models to their organization so they can have data to start that new conversation about health. So our full cost analysis, economic impact report, some of our research, and then really working in partnership and perhaps exploring some case studies that we might do with organizations in Snohomish County to lead the way of a county view of improved health, both from the employer and the county standpoint. But thank you very much for your attention, and I guess we can turn to the panel next. Thank you. Great presentation, Tom. You, you got through a lot of information in a short amount of time. You have without even taking a breath. So let's invite our panelists up, and then I'll I'll introduce you. So panelists, come on up here. So besides uh, Tom, we have um, start with Dwayne uh, Charman. Please uh, raise your hand. Director of Strategic Work. Force planning at the Boeing Company. And thank you for uh, participating. Next is Kurt Sigalski, Senior VP, Employer Solutions at Red Brick Health. Uh, next is Kathy Johnson, Senior Director of Patient and Nutrition Services at Sodexo. And finally, Emma Keith, CEO of Community Transit. So welcome, everybody. So the thought here will be um, we'll go through five questions. And um, if all of you want to answer, you're welcome to, or two or three answer, uh, that's fine as well. And then near the end, we'll ask each of you to summarize your thoughts on a key takeaway. And we'll have James, with the help of Shannon, collect those. We'll put a, a number, a, a letter to A through E, and then we'll vote on them via the Instapol. So hopefully there'll be instructions on that at the end. So. So starting off, uh, and please just uh, feel free to step forward and answer this as, as you see fit. So the first question, how are you defining health and wellness as an employer? What are some examples of current initiatives? How has, this, how has that difference, how has that been different for you today than in times past? What caused the change? Great, that was about six questions in one. So I'll, I'll answer maybe a couple of them. Um, you know, at Boeing, we have the advantage of our size, right? And, that, and that sometimes it can be a real advantage, sometimes it can be a real disadvantage. But in this case, it's been a real advantage. Um, we really focus in three different areas when we think about what we call it well-being. It used to be called wellness, now it's well-being. But it's, uh, it's the physical health of folks, the mental health, and then the financial. We, we figure if we can hit each of those three areas, uh, that we're gonna have a really engaged workforce. And, and as the doctor said, you know, uh, a big part of what we fight, fight with within ourselves is, is ourselves and our culture, and really setting the culture. So, you know, from a corporate standpoint, you can lay out a million different programs, right? And you, you've seen them come and go, but unless, the uh, leadership uh, that is your leader and your organization supports it, it, it doesn't get much traction. So I think that's one of the big lessons that we've learned is, is trying to really reach deep into the organization. Um, and, and you try to do that on top of, you know, massive amounts of overtime at certain times and all the things that happen in the business. So you gotta stay focused. Uh, because once you take one step backwards, uh, the people have a real difficult time trusting you going forward. So. Uh, that's just something that we, we really uh, are trying to come to grasp and to grips with as we And at Sodexo, um, our company mission is to improve the quality of life, not only for all of our clients, but for our employees. And as a, a global employer, it's very critical for us to really
really um, you know, do for our employees what we believe in doing for our clients, obviously. So one of the um, pilots that we um, began um, shortly is an example of how we're doing this. So in Orlando, Florida, for example, I'm home-based actually in um, Charlotte, but in Orlando, Florida, we have a wonderful collaboration with the YMCA's. We have launched um, a pilot in that area. We brought on board the Disney World employees, um, Sodexo employees, the employees from the YMCA's, and from Rollins College. And what we have done, and the reason we've done this, we're the 18th um, largest employer in the world. And who else would who else would it make sense with for a company of our size if we wanted to really help the communities where we live? You can't just work with the employees eight hours that they're at work. You have to make sure that they take that message home, and that's part of their home life. We chose the why, and it's been a wonderful collaboration. We um, have um, several phases to this pilot, and I don't want to take up all the time, but it looks like it's going to be something that's very, very meaningful for the community. It's something that offers um, sustainability. It allows that employee to bring a, an extra person with, we call it the buddy system. So whether that's a family member or whether that is just a buddy, um, and that's to, um, to help with that continuity. We also know that everyone needs a different way to really um, be part of um, a wellness and health plan. And so we prioritize and we work with the individuals to make sure that we're meeting their needs and communicating with them in the way that they choose. Yep. I'll just throw one last comment, kind of reinforce what um, Dwayne and Kathy both said. Um, the programs and interest in employers have really evolved from uh, physical health and uh, actually started with disease management, chronic conditions, and physical health and nutrition, and now have realized that if I can't afford my meds, the likelihood that I'm going to take it if I'm a chronic, some of the chronic diseases is zero. Or if I have a family situation, I'm working two jobs, um, and I'm not going to get that time, I'm stressed out beyond belief. How am I going to take care of those other things? So that concept of well-being, I think, is really taking off as I work with we work with employers around the country because it's a recognition that these are real barriers that if we can't figure out how to help our, our workforce and our families overcome, you can't get to the next part of the conversation. You can't get to um, the, the thing where you, you, you logically would, would want to start. So how do you create that broad programming to overcome the barriers? Um, to your question about what kind of shifts have taken place, a couple that occur to me. Um, I think formerly uh, we saw a focus on wellness or well-being programs for employees. I represent community transit and I see a shift of taking the concept of well-being beyond just employees, taking it to the community. Um, starting at the top with, you know, with in the transportation business, um, we make a significant contribution to clean air in the region and talk about reach. As far as I know, almost everybody in the county breathes, breathes the air, and it uh, you know got to make a contribution with uh, disease issues, health, wellness, uh, feeling good in general. We work with local jurisdictions connecting uh, pedestrian paths, bike paths. We have bike racks on our buses. We allow bikes inside of our buses. We try to encourage uh, all of those modes of transportation, and it's not just not just for the sake of mobility, but um, we're very conscious of the contribution that we can make to community health in the way that we provide our services. We talked earlier today um, not only about getting activity through use of that system, but using that system for employees to, or uh, community members to gain access to uh, activities throughout the county that promote their well-being. Um, internally, just quickly, Dwayne mentioned uh, focus on the program. While I believe our program is focused, it's also very comprehensive and it includes, for example, a tobacco-free workplace, all of our public facilities are tobacco-free, uh, wellness program with on-site coordinators, uh, free yoga and massage provided for employees, uh, wellness incentives, smoking cessation, fitness facilities. I want to come back later in response to another question and talk about a new feature we've added called our Employee Maintenance Center, an on-site pain management facility. I could go on with the list, but the strategy behind our approach is to provi provide such a, a diverse range of choices that something will appeal to everyone who's motivated to improve their well-being. Excellent. Good time. So the next question really revolves around uh, what Tom was talking about in his presentation. That's uh, the conversation with, with CFOs and um, convincing them. So the, the question is, employee wellness 2.0, does this dog hunt? 
The RAND study suggests that only positive ROI is in disease management, not in wellness programs. So how do we uh, get past that cynicism? Um, for those of you who have seen the RAND study, understand the RAND study is focused only on medical costs. And I think it's uh, very arguable that what happens is this, is that as people become healthier, as people's well-being improves, the first effect is not on healthcare cost savings. The first effect is their symptoms change, they feel better, they go to work more often, and they're more highly performing at work. So as employers start to say, how, how am I going to make the case for wellness or well-being with my CFO? Do not limit it to medical costs because these other dimensions are important. And remember this, as I said, we've done a lot of work with CFOs. Behind closed doors, CFOs will always say, so what? All the things that we believe in so deeply, they're really saying, so what? Prove it to me, prove that it matters. And as we see this transition from wellness to well-being, it's the perfect opportunity to take that next step and to say to CFOs, and here's why it matters to the things that you care about. Because right now, CFOs have a whole bunch of different paths they can go down, and we don't. I don't think anyone in this room thinks it's a good idea for CFOs to think this stuff's not important. Any CFOs in the crowd? <laughs> Oh, come on, there's got to be more. Well, um, I will speak on behalf of CFOs, uh, formerly having had uh, responsibilities. I was a CFO who believed that uh, well-being initiatives would pay back. I believe that they do. I also believe there's greater good to be gained in an organization um, uh, than, than just a financial payback. But when I think about the financial payback, if I think of our organization with all the types of leave that we provide, uh, vacation, sick leave, uh, bereavement leave, parental leave, religious observance leave, I, I could go on, uh, short-term disability, long-term disability, uh, guaranteed return to work after extended uh, absences. Um, in our organization, there are certain classifications where that results in as much as 25% of the workforce being absent on any given day. Um, it, it, so in organizational life, I mean, I mean, that should immediately transfer to the difficulty of performing your mission, the additional cost and inefficiency that's driven, <coughs> excuse me, by un, uh, un, unscheduled absences. So why wouldn't you invest in programs that, that permit people to make a choice to come to work? Ultimately, when you get up in the morning, the choice to come to work is yours. And a combination of knowing that your employer supports wellness, supports well-being, culturally uh, supports what's good for you, um, I believe, I, I believe we have demonstrated, that encourages people to make the choice to come to a friendly place and exercise those wellness options. And it pays back. Um, we find, uh, we, we look at health characteristics, you know, things like high blood pressure, uh, weight, emotional health, things of that nature. And what we've been able to do is tie that to industrial injury, lost time. And so that's something the CFOs completely understand. Um, and you know we're finding that for uh, about 30% of our folks, they've got five or more of those health risks, large. Um, and, they, and they tend to have a lot higher occurrence of industrial related injuries. Uh, you can put aside uh, just the attendance issues, coming late to work, uh, things of that nature. Um, and so for us, we, we put a dollar value on it that's about $2.40 savings for every dollar that we spend. And so uh, we've been able to go through, all the way through our board actually, of directors, um, and get uh, real great support for our programs. But it was only through monetizing it, uh, really, that we really got the traction uh, to expand the programs as much as we wanted to. Because they always start at grassroots usually, you know, and people just out of the goodness of their heart and on their spare time, they start these programs because they know in their heart that it's the right thing to do. And so uh, over time, we've really been able to move that uh, and get the financial support. At Sodexo, we stratify risk. We, um, we ask the employees to go through a biometric event. We look at that lab work. And then we identify with their interests. So, for example, if some of the blood, blood work is um, indicative of prediabetes um, or diabetes or whatever it might be, 
we, we provide programs. So, um, for example, tapping in again to the Y, um, we use their CDC program, which is approved for diabetes, and that's for the pre-diabetic. So what happens to anyone else that has a chronic disease issue? Well, that falls on our shoulders. And what we do then provide those programs. So whether it's weight loss or someone that has diabetes or someone with heart um, disease, we then provide programs to assist with them. But we don't leave out the people that are healthy and want to stay healthy. And we believe in incentives. So what we do is we have programs that actually um, they can subscribe to. So it can be text messaging, as simple as that. They can uh, work with the, um, at the, the WISE, the, um, the lifestyle managers. They're assigned a lifestyle manager, which makes sure that they're um, working out and they're doing the things that they set goals to do. So there's a variety of programs that only address uh, keeping people well, but also address, address where they are in terms of a health condition. Because if you look at the stats here in the U.S., over 50% now of the U.S. population is overweight, um, and it's growing. It's the first time ever that obesity is actually higher than just being overweight. So it's an issue, and those are really the two things that we have prioritized um, within our company. I think the last thing I'll just add is the measurement component. Um, large, very large employers for a long time they have been able to afford working with uh, data warehouse vendors and others to bring this together. But the, the advances made recently allow almost anyone to be able to do that. The data exists somewhere, you can pair it with health data, and you can create a really compelling story to your CFO. I think that should be a core part of any formal program that, that anyone in this room is pursuing. Because at the end of the day, if you can prove whether it be productivity, loss of wages, um, uh, accidents in the workplace, it becomes a much more compelling story. Um, so just challenge yourselves and whoever you're working with to measure. Thank you guys. You guys are doing a great job, by the way. <laughs> um, so the next question really is along the lines of a sensitive subject. It is privacy, uh, the rights of the privacy of an individual and the company is helping pay for the health care costs or covering most of it in many cases. So how far should an employer be able to go influencing the health of employees? Who wants that question, do they? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Uh, what we have done is uh, we think it's very important that we offer care first. We need to get people um, engaged, so whether that's an incentive or whether that's just making the right choice, the easy choice. So for example, at, at our, uh, our eateries around the country, we have about 9,000 sites in the U.S. And at, at our eateries, we provide what we call the mindful program, which is um, a very healthy concept. And within the three years that it was rolled out, we have saved five tons of salt and 14 tons of sugar from our consumers' diets. So again, it, it can make a big, huge change. Um, we serve 15 million people um, every day in the U.S., so that's why the numbers appear so large. So, large. so that's something that, that everyone can do and that we are doing. We're trying to make the, the easy choice. And then after that, we haven't got to the part yet where we're, we're bringing in the sticks, but we're, we're right now um, starting with the carrots. And I, I think this is one we need to be really honest about. Uh, and I think the honesty is most employers have said to their employees, you need to be healthier so we can save money. That's been the message from employers to employees. Now, the fact of the matter is, the broader context is that employees don't go to work for one employer and stay there for their careers. Employees don't feel their employer has made a commitment to them. But I think this healthcare issue is an opportunity to change that conversation. And if employers are honest enough to say to their employees, look, your health matters to you, it's good to be healthy because you get to do the things that you like to do. Your health matters to us, not only because of healthcare costs, but the other uh, productivity related issues. We need to enter into a partnership. We're going to invest in your health and we expect your commitment to that as well. We're in this together. Our business matters, your jobs matter. We're in this together. It's not just about healthcare cost savings, that's a part of it, it's not the only part. But it is a partnership, and we're willing to invest, but you have to participate as well. I think that changes the conversation. It certainly gives a different view of the culture of the organization relative to employees in there. Well, a couple of thoughts in response to what Tom was saying, and I very much agree with what you said. Um, 
I mean, clearly, there's a uh, there's a cost efficiency and effectiveness motive. Um, we emphasize with our employees that uh, if you're feeling better, you'll engage better with people. We're a customer service provider. Um, most of our employees uh, drive a bus for us. They're, they're, they create the first impression with our, with our customers and, and they create the lasting impression with our customers and when they feel better, they're better ambassadors um, for the customers that we serve. And inside the building, nobody does anything by, them, by themselves anymore. You get things done by working with people. And if somebody comes to work and they're not feeling well, judge from your own experience, how the quality of your interactions with the other people that you have to work with that day if you're not feeling well or they're not feeling well. And relationships and the synergy that comes from people's ability to work well together is so important and so directly correlated to how well a person is feeling. And we, we really emphasize those points. Now some other thoughts I'll share, but I want to pass the microphone down. I would just add, I think it goes along the same lines as, as what we've all been saying. Uh, but the underlying foundation is if you don't have trust and transparency in the relationship with your with your team, this is going to be very, very difficult. Um, and, you know, kind of like the other issue I said, you know, once you've done it wrong once, it's a lot harder to recover from it um, than if you, you just kind of plot it along in, in a positive way. So, uh, and I think um, I've seen that um, at the Boeing company where we've done some missteps and it's very difficult then to win back uh, the trust of the employees on these sort of issues because it is, there's something in it for all of us here. And um, I think trying to uh, uh, tell folks that, hey, it's, it, we love you, we care for you, it's all about you, uh, without saying, yeah, there's a, there's a good business case to be made here too. And if we're, if we're financially healthy as a company, you're emotionally, physically healthy, healthy and financially healthy, we all we all win, you know, because we all get to keep working, you know. So, I think the transparency part and that trust is really important. As someone who gets to see lots of different employers and programs, I would just say the answer to this question is incredibly culturally uh, uh, connected to that workforce. Um, I was in front of an employer a couple weeks ago. Very high performance, pay for performance. They measure everything. They reward that way. Their health program, their health and wellness program reflected that culture. It was more measurement driven, reward driven. That wouldn't fall on its face in another organization. So at the end of the day, you just have to be sensitive to the type of relationship you have, the culture you've built, and make sure that program does, isn't out of step with, with what's going on every day in the workforce. You started to touch upon uh, the next question. What are lessons that you're learning about what motivates people to improve health in your organization? Since I've got the mic, I'll just keep going this way. <laughs> um, someone mentioned it earlier, and we actually have data on this in our book of business, but, but consumer choice is the most important dimension you can have in a program around um, how, the, how successful and how much engagement you're going to get. Each of us comes to um, health and these, these uh, programs and topics with our own set of issues, uh, risks, characteristics, barriers, preferences. And if you put a wide range of, of things out there and then create some way to create some recommendations for me so I don't have to filter through the noise, the likelihood that I'll find something that's meaningful to me in the medium and the timing and the, the preference, uh, you're gonna, I'll, I'll grab onto that and succeed. So choice uh, in our, in our um, we did a quick study where we looked at uh, participation across three different types of engagement. So it was tracking, it was a digital interaction, and then were someone working on, on the phone we measured your rear cohorts objective data in terms of biometric changes and guess what all three types or mediums yielded about the same result and what that said was when allowed to choose you're going to pick the option that works best for you so I, that would be the takeaway is, is choice and relevant choice within your within your programs and we we'll certainly agree with that um, i think some of the other things that are important is, um, for example, you know, just the variety of solutions that you mentioned, because there's not one solution that'll work for everyone, and there's not one way to communicate that'll work for everyone. So I think part of it is just identifying with your audience and understanding what they need. So I think the communication and the feedback, and it's certainly so critical to market what you're doing to the employees so that they, um, you know, understand and, and know and, and can respond to you. So I would, that's probably what we would say. 
A um, couple that I'd add is, uh, I think we kind of mentioned earlier, is the leadership engagement. So if the, if the leaders are not engaged, uh, then it goes nowhere. And uh, the other one I would add is the, being able to integrate um, the, work pro the, the programs that are going on at work with what's going on at home or wherever else they spend their time. So that's kind of the new one for us that we're trying to figure out is how do we integrate you know, these work life kind of programs that we're launching here with the community. And so we're trying to uh, link up more with our local corporate citizenship organizations so that we look for opportunities to blend the two. Um, question, how do you motivate people to access programs that are available? Here's a specific example. Um, and I agree with everything I've heard so far, but I haven't heard this one, pain. And that's been our most recent initiative. If you're in pain, and if we could provide services that were convenient, no charge, private, that would help you get out of pain, would you give it a try? And that is how we started. Um, we've been very, we have been successful. What we did was implement an on-site pain management clinic. It's operated by a third party. It's staffed by certified athletic trainers and physical therapists. Uh, other levels of, of care are available as needed. Uh, it's 50 feet from 400 plus of our employees. They can access it before work, after work, during work. Uh, it's private. Uh, and we so far have been able to demonstrate uh, success with, uh, with employees in pain, being treated, and um, resolving the pain. Our, ultimately our goal, we wanted to start with people who were in pain because we figured they'd be easier to motivate. The goal is to and this is a, it's an almost generational goal, it feels like sometimes, is to get everyone out of pain, but then get them to understand the correlation between their behaviors and their fitness and their pain, and provide, uh, do occupational assessments, uh, determine what sort of, of fitness is necessary to prevent them from repeating that cycle of pain, give them a fitness plan, and then send them, send them out to other facilities, which we also provide, to improve their fitness, to, to get out of that uh, in and out cycle of pain. Very, uh, very pleased with the way that program is progressing and, and a good example. I think there's probably a short and a longer term answer to this. And the short term answer is, hey, a lot of employers are using financial incentives <coughs> to get employees to participate in programs, to provide biometric data. I mean, you know, it, it's no shock that the reason people come to work for you is you pay them. But at the same time, employers tell me that that keeps going up. It, 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 employees expect to be paid more the next year for doing the same thing. So and this, the longer term issue is kind of that intrinsic motivation. How do you find ways so that employees really embrace this is a good thing for me? And pain is a great example of that intrinsic motivation. I think that's really the ultimate solution in in this is finding those things that motivate the employees themselves. A lot of people, older people will say, I, I take care of myself because I really want to be around for my grandchildren. So there are ways, I think, to find the things that intrinsically motivate people to take care of themselves. I think the short term we see employers paying incentives, that's not a long term solution. Just to add one more, we, we're, we're right in the middle of uh, Boeing on the move right now. And so we've got 35,000 people at the Everett site, 25,000 of them are participating for eight weeks, right? And, and how you get them to do that, or what we found motivates people is one competition, which was mentioned earlier today. You get into teams and you start plotting your steps and, and you know, a $50 Amazon card. I mean, so this is not uh, like really expensive stuff. Um, I guess it is when you think about 25,000 people, but I guess for me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's not, it's, it, it's pretty simple, and people kind of self-motivate themselves around that, those sort of things. So I'm gonna uh, ask the panel to boil it down to just one takeaway that we can take back to the big group. But before I do that, I thought I would just, probably have time for just a couple questions out in the, in the audience if anybody wants to throw something out to the panel. Thoughts on that? Yes, Bob. Um, we talked about uh, having a program for, for uh, nutrition and so on and so forth to be, you know, to be uh, more dedicated and so on and so forth. How do you educate people, your employees, to better, to exercise more, and, and show them how to do these things rather than just say, uh, 
it, you see, it's about creating behaviors. And so how do you teach them how to do something? So for example, you know, education by itself is not going to get the job done. It's, an important, it's a part of it. But I'm sure there's not one person left in the United States that understands smoking is a bad thing. Yet we have 18% of us still doing it. So education won't get it done. But there's some great tools you can use that help people create habits. For example, one of the digital journeys that Redbird created was, um, we got a whole bunch of them, but one of them up is called Cart Hero, and it's about how to create healthier and make healthier choices in the grocery store. Because if you do that, the food that comes home is going to be better, the food you pull out the refrigerator is going to be better, and you inherently start to create um, a better uh, pattern of eating at home. But how do you do that? And there's just small steps you commit to, you do it over time, and if you think about how habits form, it's doing small things or little little um, uh, things over top over a period of weeks, and things start to stick. So, so these things, the things we put in front of folks, have to at least be based on some behavioral science to say how can we help people form the habits. Once it sticks, when I go to the grocery store, I'll likely make that same healthy choice again six months from now, or a year from now, or five years from now. But I think it's about habit formation. I think it's also about senior leadership. If we demonstrate um, to all of our employees what what is healthy and what is what we consider well-being, that sort of follows through. If they see, you know, their leaders, their bosses doing these things, I think they're they'll think twice about well, maybe it really is important they're doing it. <laughs> and and the other thing too, I, I think, you know, um, you just make it um, you make it fun. It, So if you have these activities and it's not fun, people won't come and they won't participate and you won't engage. So it's, it's got to be fun. And a lot of our places, what we do is we have um, chefs come in and they do demonstrations of cooking and the dietitians join them and they explain why it's healthy. And then they go through the cafes and the eateries and they choose those same foods. And then it, we provide tips for them to take home. So again, we're educating, but it's kind of in a fun way and it's not in a way that says you can't do something. I have one more quick thought from the panel, then we're going to move on to our final piece. Uh, I would just offer some of the, think the more obvious strategies. Um, all of them revolve around communication and making sure employees know that certain um, nutrition information is available to them. We have nutritionists available to counsel employees individually and collectively. Um, we have cook-offs. We provide cooking classes. When we cater meals, we're always careful to try to provide healthy choices. We eat all the time for every reason under the sun. I uh, had a great debate recently about what we provide when we, when the employer provides refreshments. There was a carrot crowd and a carrot cake crowd. Uh, had a great internal conversation. Our, our employee newsletter covered the debate. And now, you know, you, so we always provide healthy choices. Um, and, and fairly recently, maybe two years ago now, we used to have the standard vending machines. Our employees are on the go. Coach operators get there, sign in, sign out, hit the road, likely to grab something out of the vending machine. And the choices used to be very poor nutritionally. We now provide a fresh market vending service where fresh products are brought in every day. Employees can put in requests. Um, the company that's providing that service carefully monitors the employees' choices and, and to make sure that they adjust and bring in the right quantity, the freshest things, the most popular things on a daily basis. So I think a, a combination of communicating a collection of those kind of activities sends the message that nutrition is important and it's supported. Thank you. So now we're going to get uh, Shannon and James put to work and we're going to ask each of you in just sort of a summary what one big takeaway you want uh, this group to know and then we'll take that back to the big group and then we'll even do a voting on that. Okay. So stay tuned for that. But, um, so Tom, we'll start with you while we're working on this. So Tom, final thoughts from you. And I, if, if you're lucky enough to be in an organization where your senior leaders say, this is the right thing to do, do it, that's great. But we also know senior leaders change. And one senior leader can come in and say, prove it. And if you can't prove it, then everything can fall apart. So I guess my sense is be in a position to be able to understand and talk the language of the CFO as you're talking about the value of what you're bringing to your companies. You want to align your interests with the business, you want to align your interests in these investments and these programs with how CFOs are viewing their business and how this contributes to the uh, success of the organization. Okay, get that? Okay. Shannon, do you have any? Yeah. 
I'll get, I'll get to a sound bite, but I'm, I'm reminded of a quote that I heard probably 30 years ago from a management consultant, Meg Wheatley. Uh, Meg's phrase was, uh, coaching employees and organizations and children in classrooms, take care of this place, take care of others, and take care of yourself. I think that's, that's great guidance. I think the key is that leadership in your organization has to really internalize that. It has to be genuine. It has to be intrinsic on the part of leadership. You can't just preach it. You need to live it. You need to, you need to be accountable yourself and, and try to help other people hold themselves accountable for taking care of the place, taking care of other people, and taking good care of themselves. Hey, how's Shannon doing here? So you got So I think for me, I'd say, um, as I started off and said, you know, there's physical, there's mental, and there's financial. Um, I think it's fairly easy to go, not easy, but it's easy to talk about physical and financial. Mental is hard. And uh, there's as many people suffering from mental issues as there is from purely physical or financial or any of the others. So I think we tend to forget about mental, um, but it has far-reaching effects by people who look very normal in the workplace because of what they're dealing with at home. So I would say don't forget the mental uh, wellness uh, piece. And my suggestion would be to document your outcomes. I bet most of you in this room are doing something. Document what's working, document what's not working, communicate that to the employees because that will sell the program. It will also help you in the second and third years and moving on to, to improve the program that you have. Okay, sounds good. I'll just reiterate the point I made earlier said. I think it's key and that's um, Make sure the program or the work that you do is culturally relevant to your organization and that there is choice um, for me as an individual, whether it be uh, in the medium, in the way, in the time. Um, if I have a, a choice in front of me that works for me, I'm going to engage and you're going to see better results. So for the you in the audience, uh, now your job is to vote. So um, what are we doing? So you go to text, you, you text ballroom 3 to 22333, and then you vote on either A, B, C, D, or E. And I can read those through real quickly. A is really understand the CFO view of the bottom line and how that relates to the business um, and to healthcare. B, take care of others. Um, Others in the place, the CEO leadership is the example. Be genuine as you're uh, delivering these programs. C, don't forget the mental wellness side of the, of the equation. We talk a lot about the physical wellness side, but don't forget the mental health uh, wellness aspect of things. D, communicate and document outcomes. So be system, systematic about this. Are you, are you documenting it? Are you measuring it? And E is choice and cultural, culturally relevant. Is it, are we giving our employees choice and uh, letting them feel like they have choice in the matter? We cover that, did we capture that, do you think, panel? Let's give the panel a, a very big hand. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so if you would just take a moment to vote, we'll take that back to the general session, and I think we're done here. Oh, we're going to see on the screen. Oh, how exciting.